50 Shades. Yep. A total of 35, 36 million copies sold in that, in that decade. I was in a, a relationship with the publisher of those books. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a working relationship, and everybody in that building became outraged when that, when that series was published. They had a party, and at that party, they gave 50 Shade bonuses to everyone. Wow. And connected it directly to Fifty Shades. So he said, this book has done so well. Everybody got, they, they wanted mutual guilt and complicity. Everybody was pulling cash off of Fifty Shades. And the belief system changed very rapidly. Money changes people quick. Yeah, here we are back at SASP. Some episode I'm not sure of, but we're about three I'm told, years in. I'm, I'm told we're about to do 100, episode 160 sometime here soon. Not today, but yes. It's huge. We're on our way. Um, I, I wondered, we we met a bunch of SASF listeners this past weekend. A, we did. A, a big number of them, especially from Canada. And I may have to, I don't know, they seemed like nice it's not, people. It's not pronounced that way. Canada? Yes. <laughs> They seemed almost like Americans who like loneliness and cold, <laughs> like pretty normal. And more oppression. <laughs> yeah. And governmental overreach. <laughs> yeah. They did, they did say they didn't like that. but Cold, lonely, oppressive. But they were nice people and they do like our podcast. You know, nobody has ever said that Canadians aren't nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think they're aware of that. I couldn't figure out if they were more like Midwesterners or more like English people who've lost their accent. That's what I was trying to figure out. Midwesterners who migrated north. Upper Midwest. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So. I think so. I actually don't know how many Canadians I met because I didn't really. You didn't dig into their birthplaces? Yeah, I, I didn't. <laughs> I know at least a couple, but. Yeah. Anyway. So, uh, yeah, we met some people. Right. And, and you received feedback that you're supposed to be more combative. Yeah. So look for me getting angry, I guess. M more combativeness from Brian. Right. But I have to have an opinion that justifies it. I think it's the bigger issue <laughs> Okay, here. so let's start with that. Let's start by... <laughs> we'll start with an opinion that I deeply care about. And then, and we need you to yell outrageous yeah. into the microphone. Outrageous! <laughs> <laughs> Are you out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to try that. Yes. Uh, um, It'll be good. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, no, having thousands of visitors to Moscow, Idaho is pretty fun. So... Uh, it, yeah, and it happens... On the reg. Right. Yeah. So what are we talking about today, Brian? Uh, today, I wanted I wanted to just, we'll do a little survey. This will, this will feel a bit like a, uh, a SASF kind of summary, I guess, because I have the, the overall top-selling titles from the 20 teens. Okay. And I thought it would be fun to just kind of run down the list. Top-selling titles from that decade? From that decade, yeah. Okay. Yep. And uh, I mean, do you, I'm, I'm sure you can guess the the main top sellers are gross. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So Fifty Shades. Yep. All were spots one, two, and three yep. with a total of thirty five, thirty six million copies sold in that in that decade, which is an ex lovely, an extravagant number. Is this North America only? Uh, let's see. Because that actually seems like a low number to me. Yeah, I think so. I think it's the N NPD group. Okay. I, I was told 50 on that series, so I don't... Um, yeah, that was 2011, 2011, and 2012. Yeah, for those ones. I was in, uh, I was in a, a relationship with the publisher of those books. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a working relationship, and... Everybody in that building became outraged when that, when that series was published. And what they did to, to deal with it, to address it, is they had a, a holiday party, a Christmas party. Uh, they had a party. And at that party, they gave 50 shade bonuses to everyone. Wow. And connected it directly to Fifty Shades. So he said, this book has done so well. Everybody got, they, they wanted mutual guilt and complicity. Everybody was pulling cash off of Fifty Shades. And the belief system changed very rapidly. Money changes people quick. 
So all of a sudden it turns from like, wow, I'm embarrassed that we published this to what well, was a okay. legacy. And especially cause there's particular imprints in that, uh, publishing family. There are particular imprints that are quite hoity toity. Right. You know, yeah. they're very Pulitzer, Nobel, yeah. you know, national book award imprints that were hating that affiliation and the editors and tastemakers and everybody were not, they were not loving the fact that the entire company be, you know, went under this a porn smut, rebrand. Smut publisher, yeah. Yeah, and so that they grabbed pornographic fan fiction off the internet, you know, published it in mass market pulp and just went, you know, crazy mad. And there's actually a whole, it's not like this hasn't existed before, but there's an entire industry spun off by that, especially on TikTok, uh, book talk. It's, and there's just a ton of like, very hardcore fiction that gets sold on TikTok and to housewives. Uh, I'm, I'm sure to single women as well, but just a ton of it that moves that's still in the wake of 50 shades. Wow. And so yeah. it's very taboo. It's, it's very um, not traditional romance novel. It's, it's very taboo porn and moves massive units even stuff that's a little more soft core. I know there's a, uh, Aaron wrench, my business partner was approached to try to represent broker a deal with a major house for somebody who was self publishing stuff on TikTok uh, and just selling on book talk. And they were moving 40,000 units a month, self published. And it turned out to be porn. Mm. You know, it's like, Oh yeah. Um, this was a believer of an author writing this. So a professing Christian, Pumping. Okay, what what gives um, here? <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? What was that? Uh, it was so it was not as bad as Fifty Shades. It's basically right, right. but it was soft. soft it, core. I, it was still bad. I mean, it was. Yeah. I would soft core is even like a not a correct description for prose, but mm -hmm. Fifty Shades was this big low water mark yeah. for uh, physical publishing in America, especially out of traditional publishing houses. And it has defined a whole ghetto of horrifically awful stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's usually self pubbed until it hits a certain amount of viral uh, level. And then a publisher will write a fat check and, and try to grab it. So I think it's also changed expectations for success, right? I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of Twilight and that yep. whole, you know, what is. Yeah, the goal for success. I mean, we're now we're now at the point Money. where yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it just if it sells, I feel like we're at the point where yeah. that's all that matters. Maybe that's all that has. But I, I personally kind of like knowing that because I differentiated guilt in my head uh, through that whole skyscraper <laughs> where oh yeah where I worked, um, and I liked knowing that every single one of those people who had turned their noses up and, and was saying, well, my imprint would never, all of them were handed 50 shades money. They got paid. All of them mm. got 50 shades money. And, uh, you know, I like to know that. That's that's it's kind <laughs> Let of, it be upon their heads. <laughs> I guess the option when you get handed 50 shades money is to quit or. No, they did actually, it, they, the same house owned some, uh, quote unquote, Christian imprints, uh, Christian shingles. So I don't know. If that's the case, if the Christian. for everybody, I don't know if they all got it. I should ch I should double check. Yeah, and be like, hey, you who you people publishing this Christian series and these Christian authors, did you get Fifty Shades money? Okay, though. Like, following up though, hasn't that kept happening every year then? Because the movies can only have been a, or do they do do the movies? It was an annual bonus. So I yeah. mean, the Fifty Shades continues to be big, but that moment, yeah, they were dealing with an internal morale PR. Bit of a mutiny mm -hmm. uh, from the more serious in the building. Yeah, because the Pulitzer Prize says their <laughs> only adjective they used to describe are distinguished. They yeah. want to say that we do distinguished novels. And unfortunately, bondage novels, yeah. <laughs> tough to make distinguished. Yeah, so <laughs> if, you, uh, if you're an editor in, uh, in a big conglomerate and you have an imprint with a hoity-toity name and you have a hoity-toity history... This is not to say that you have not published smut. All of those yeah. shingles have published smut, but it's very artistic and important. They yeah. had their own scruples. They had their own weird little uh, boundaries. And usually it's a matter of ratio, I think. 
So some be of like, that, but also I think it's. I mean, that, isn't well, it like if, they would say it's a matter of art? Yeah, if it's pretty enough, we can drop it's, the smut. If it's as long as it's avant garde and it's artistic and it's yeah. whatever, it's important. It's cocktail party important. Uh, they would publish it, mm. but they felt superior to this other part of the company, and then all of them were made equal. And I do, I enjoy that. And so I do. It's this is not to say, oh, those poor artistic yeah. people. They were doing terrible things too. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but so this I, is really a case of the emperor has no clothes, more of a situation of like. It's it's also really interesting because if I was working there, and I was uh, involved in one of the faith imprints, you know, in one of the Christian imprints that they own, and then they're trying to hand me Fifty Shades money. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. It's a little interesting because money's fungible. So the fact that they're saying this is Fifty Shades money, it's like, well, is it though? Actually, like you don't. Was mm-hmm. I not already receiving Fifty Shades money? Like it's yeah, I work for you. It's all all this yeah. water is going into the water tank, and the water's running everywhere. So really, you got to designate this check, this bonus mm-hmm. you tied specifically to something to try to incur this mutual guilt. Somehow. So I guess it's just the question of this: is this King of Sodom money? He's right. going to Abraham, being like this money. But I think at that or point, or is this Egyptian gold? <laughs> right, is this Egyptian gold or King of Sodom money? And I, luckily, I was not in that position. Yeah. So. And I would not have been, but yeah. anyway. Anyway, okay. I don't know how I just got off on that, but that's the sales of, of the teens. Fifty Shades was the behemoth, and we are talking about something that was across three uh, books of pornographic fan fiction that was already free on the internet. Fan fiction of Twilight, just to connect yeah. all the dots, yeah. And so this bondage fan fiction that was extra porno, off, you know, people who loved Twilight, then outsold Twilight. By a lot. Which, by the way, we should probably... Which outsold Harry Potter. Yeah. By a lot. Which we should jump back around and say, that's why Twilight, don't read it. That's what it's about. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I just recently saw some adult adult women wearing Twilight shirts. uh, and and, And I thought... They were at the Boise Aquarium. And I thought, what are you doing? Hmm. And then I realized, I think that was like... They probably read it in high school. Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe they're just uh, just loyal Mormons. Hmm. Is she Mormon? Yeah. Oh, oh, Twilight. Yeah, Twilight. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And it makes total sense. There's actually, um, it's not it's not an, it's not the only place that vampire stuff shows up in among Mormon authors, but the metaphor does kind of work a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you get into some of the weirder corners of okay of Mormon theology. That that vampiric dude, yeah, especially populating planets, <laughs> calling a woman into immortality. Um, <laughs> anyway, we're way off. We're way off no, the reservation I, I think now. It's, I think this matters for a stories or soul food podcast because on to the on to book number four is another one you've talked about a lot, and this was published in two thousand eight. But Hunger Games yeah. sold another eight million copies this past decade. Yeah, good good for her. Yeah, way to go, Suzanne. Well done, you. Yep, and then and uh, I think I've, been, I've already expressed enough heartburn about that series. Right, we're just gonna say so, good for reference episode right. episodes one through fifty eight. Even some of your, I mean, uh, your non your published nonfiction articles deal with that. I think. Yeah, I upset people. Yeah, I think actually I, I can't remember where that was published. It might have been like on the Gospel Coalition, I think it was. somewhere on Trevor yep. and Wax's thing, and created a lot of heat that I was. Opposed, and I, I would say also, I, I think I said plenty of times. She knows how to craft a novel. Yeah, she crafted a, an extremely fast-paced, pot-boiling novel that it makes complete sense why its story gripped everybody. Mm-hmm. It just also has that Darwinian bait and switch that's not actually wholesome or healthy. And here you said you weren't going to get into it, but yeah, okay, <laughs> moving on, <laughs> moving on. Uh, and then the help, we had the help. Okay, yep, eight point yeah, seven sure. million. Never yep. read, never watched. I mean, I think I did. Did I watch it? I probably we probably did. But point. I'm surprised that it's that many. It's a lot. I just it's wondered, a lot. Is it just? I'm assuming it was an Oprah book club pick, and this is where a lot of these pick up mass market just have to read the book. Yeah, but to hit a number like that, it's it's actually got to resonate and achieve a kind of grassroots. Well, see, I remember virality. I remember scenes from that book, so she's 
So she was good. So yeah. yeah. So there's moments that But you you have to in order to move from the movie, those, I should say I didn't, yeah, read, didn't read from the book. from to move numbers like that, you need people who are reading it telling other people you have to read this. Yeah. And getting that kind of uh, viral exchange among consumers is the only way to get to those those numbers. And also, this may be the nasty part of me, but I'm trying to be more contrarian. <laughs> Okay. I'm ready. This is not a great take. Outrageous. (laughs) Outrageous. Uh, It does seem like there's just a little bit of our white guilt that plays into stories like that. That that uh, that that. What white guilt? I don't know what you're talking about. Me neither. See, I already gave up. (laughs) (laughs) No, I I think it hit timely. You know, especially something that's published at the start of that. Let me just say this about the help. For all I know, it's great. Like, I have no reason to think it's not a good book. Yeah. It might not be a good book, but it's probably, I, I would, from where I'm sitting, would assume it's well-crafted. Yeah. It's well-constructed, or else it would not have done right. what it has done. So there's an immediate kind of respect. Does that follow for Fifty Shades, though? Or Yeah. Because the, the hook is deep in that one. It's sharp. So I would say even, even with Fifty Shades, while it's clearly vice- how many people have sat down and written smut? Yeah. And so that's this is probably the most populated genre out there yeah. of people yeah. just writing crap. So I would assume that she can craft a sentence and she can build a paragraph and she can drive one page to the next and she can structure something. That that's just a given. Yeah. Or else it could not have possibly borne the weight. Of the massive of, of, attention, of yeah. that amount of attention, you can't just write gross. It's not stuff just on it's not page. just shock. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's not just gross stuff. Now that doesn't mean there's any value in reading it. You know, right. I'm not I'm not interested. Um, my dad wrote a, a piece on HuffPo called Fifty Shades of Prey, which is great, and yeah. I think that's I would refer you to it if you're curious about. What you, and and what he you also think wrote the ebook series. "Bundling with Vampires," which is yes. a step by step, <laughs> step by step review of Twilight, yep. which is incredible. And I made him do this, by the way. I actually, you, I told yeah, okay, him I was not going to read Twilight, but I guilted him as a pastor into reading Twilight, and said he had to. And he had bundling with vampires, so he wrote that one, and then he wrote his Fifty Shades of Prey. And if you are wondering as a Christian, like, what should I think of these things? Like, well, there you go. I could recommend both of those resources right. heartily. I'll make sure you find those on Canada Fifty Plus. Shades of Prey on HuffPo and Bundling with Vampires. Yeah. Um, but I would not I would not just flippantly patronize something that sold that many units as she doesn't know how to write. Yeah. Like her moral compass is completely lost. But yeah. that has nothing to do with prose craft. But I wouldn't go right try to investigate any more closely than I already have. Yeah. So the help is nothing like that. The help is a different kind of a different kind of a book. And I don't know that I would, um, I don't know that I would enjoy it. I don't know that I would find that it was a good and healthy and wholesome book. I have no reason to think that I would or wouldn't because I don't remember enough about it. Yeah. And I didn't watch the film, but even like, even like a book like eat, pray, love, which I do know to be horrific and bad, mm. you know, in it, you know, to its core, a, even a book like that cannot like soar and succeed apart from, uh, having some pretty good clockwork in there, some pretty good craftsmanship, uh, underneath what is an appalling skin and on an appalling architecture. You might not like Frank Lloyd Wright, mm. but you cannot patronize him. Sure. You know, it's like, it's he, what he's doing, he's doing it with, um, intentionality and purpose and in very, very disciplined and was highly impactful mm-hmm. in society for good or ill. And you could, you could disagree with it and fight with it, but there's, there's something that's a little bit beyond that. So if somebody's like, yeah, I moved 9 million units. That's and okay. Yeah. With this particular, you know, right. and not porn, <laughs> like, I yeah. moved nine, nine same, million same units. Like a, I'm gonna I'm gonna tip my cap. An a NBA bit. player, you know, breaking the thirty thousand career points. It's like, yeah, he can. There score. we go. You you know, I'm not. You know, I'm not. LeBron's a great basketball player. He might not be the goat. <laughs> <laughs> but the, yeah, exactly. Which he's not, by the way. But Jordan for you. Yeah. Oh yeah. See, here's where if I was following people's advice, I would be like, no, LeBron's fantastic. <laughs> Outrageous. <laughs> but I actually. Agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Uh, uh, okay. 
A couple more. We're just going to do the top 10 because they're... Okay, just buzz through. Yeah, So good job the help. Yep. Uh, Girl on the Train. That surprised me. Okay. Uh, I did read that one. Published in 2015, 8.2 million copies in those remaining years. That kind of shocks me, actually. It is. But I think it's that crossover that's happening between literary fiction that's supposed to be hoity-toity and also genre fiction, which means that you get to read it and feel smart. So it's... Yeah, it's, it's... Uh, you know, it's the sirloin at Outback Steakhouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, I think it has those thriller bones on some decent writing or descriptive. Did you writing. read it? I didn't. I think my wife did. Yeah. I, I pumped it out on some flight somewhere. Yeah. You know, it was one of those books that I grabbed and I actually had a, I think I said this before I had this habit where I would walk into an airport bookstore, uh, on any layover and I'd grab a book Yeah. and my goal was to drop it in the trash can when I left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or just set it somewhere for somebody else to read if it wasn't awful. Right. Um, well, that's my the goal story was to finish one. Food. You're, yeah, eating, so, you're eating if one on a flight. So yeah. I, would try to, I would try to rip through. Um, and that's, that's harder now because I'd walk, I just did this on, on a flight and I walked into the store. I was like, I'm not going to do any of these. Mm. It's the first one that I remember. I know that obviously I'm, I'm, an, I'm not the target demographic, but it's the first one I remember that was like a real close blend of thriller with marketed like literary fiction. I'm curious if we're going to get to the headwaters of that book, because that book is a downstream derivative of others. Let's see. Let's see. Next, we've got Gone Girl. Yep. Boom. Okay. There you go. That was the number eight. You yeah. know, also over eight million copies. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay. the one, you think, that follows it? That uh, basically, Girl on the Train was, there's this kind of weird tension as people are figuring out what to do with things like girl with a dragon tattoo. Yeah. Stieg. And, Old and, Stieg Larson. And others, which was way too dark and way too yeah. rapey and, and yep. just kind of had an edge. Gone girl shows up girl on the train and, and girl on the train was later. I think it was after gone girl. Yep. It was gone girl, 2012 and girl on the train, 2015. Yeah. So it's gone girl. I remember showing up and kind of defining this new thing, you know, this, worthy of book clubs and I can read this with some import. Yeah. Um, this is interesting. It's mm. something more than pulp. I'm not, yeah, <laughs> I'm not just reading something pulpy from the grocery store. I'm reading something a little more elevated than that. So I feel good about myself and yet people who are used to reading things that are more elevated and have been just chewing on grape nuts and gravel up there mm-hmm. could come down and not feel like they were totally slumming. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and actually enjoy a story that is moving and it's propelled and yeah, you know, it, it, and it's it, not completely funny. yeah you know reading the because uh, I mean you head into a Marilyn Robinson book as much as I do like Marilyn yeah. Robinson and you you don't ever find a chapter break there aren't <laughs> chapters they're just wandering character driven nothing plot whatsoever. Which, I mean, occasionally you'd like some plot for some roughage. <laughs> <laughs> or for the opposite of roughage, <laughs> for some substance. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what was that for Gun Girl? Uh, the Fault in Our Stars, of course. Oh, Jonathan. Yep. John Green, another one who's... I mean, congrats to John Green, but... For driving his own career to the heights. Yeah. I mean, I think he's moved to... Was he self publishing first? I was just... I was trying to remember the arc that the John. I was, just, I was just telling a story earlier today about an event that we did together in Atlanta that was that was nightmarish. Um, we'll do share. He's. Yeah. <laughs> it was I'm, public. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and just say, you don't want to be around drunk librarians. Oof. I'm just going to leave it there. Oh no. And it was a very large, very large group, and it was punctuated with a number of them. Uh, he's a really nice guy mm. and he's very clever and he like Nicholas Sparks figured out a formula that would resonate and go. And yeah. so again, it's and, not, and it's the, not something I admire in terms of like, I don't like the food on the plate, but the formula is girl, young girl with a, you know, overly inflated male perspective kind of shoved uh, from her point of view. So a very intelligent perspective put into a young girl's POV. So at least from, I'm going off of turtles all the way down, I guess. So he, but he built, so he built his brand exchanging comic videos with his brother and they got a bunch of followers and they had this kind of this base of a bunch of followers who knew him before he was moving any units. 
And they was were, that via YouTube or what? I think so. Okay. Um, uh, and they were funny. And then suddenly he starts rolling out these dying cancer girl books right. into that ecosystem, which was really weird because it was not to that brand, but he had that platform. Yeah. And of those followers, a ton of them were in the demographic that he wanted to reach. So if you are sitting here thinking that most people buying books are female, most people reading books are female, you know, guys are kind of bailing on this uh, as a medium in general. How do I really yeah. go? Like, how do I hit the chord, the right chords to create a hook and a pop song that will just be an earworm, mm -hmm. you know, across summers? And so for Nicholas Sparks, he actually, uh, I'm trying to remember what his backstory was, what other, his other job was. I feel like it was a lawyer, but I could be wrong. And he did. Is he it notary. I have I have that idea as well. But he uh, noticed that there were not romance novels written for women by men, mm. and he thought that having a male voice writing, like a very female-driven, feminine romance novel, would resonate in a, in a different way. And boy, was he correct. <laughs> so, Nailed that one. Yeah, yeah, like there, there it goes. Um, so same thing for John. Huge Green. numbers. John Green's doing something a little different than that. Yeah, but he's still targeting a very specific mark market and hitting very key notes. And like that the, are like the mortality note is just the intense. heart wrench. Yeah, the yeah. heart wrenching. Plus um, the snarky humor, obviously, which is I think that comes seems yes. to, to resonate with the and he and that's, about. that's authentically who he is. He's genuinely yeah. quirky and funny and quick. Oh, mm. uh, so it's hmm. anyway, it, it surprises me that that made it that far up, but I, it, I shouldn't be yeah. surprised. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, I should have mentioned this earlier, but number nine on our list is girl with the dragon tattoo. Yeah. But, and you know, published in two, which I would have expected. Yeah. But yeah, ha hit, hit its stride and did just under 8 million copies. I am trying to remember why everybody felt like they needed to read that. Is it because it's a cool title? Is Maybe. it because the cover was kind of neat? Cool I, title, cool cover. I, I like coming from a weird market. You yeah. didn't know. I like that genre. I mean, I like the genre of like you know hard boiled detective yeah. sort of. And yep. and so when that came on, I was like, oh, a Norwegian guy. Yeah. He's dead. I don't remember if he was dead at that point. <laughs> um, yeah, I think he was. I think so. So it was like posthumous and turned into an event. Yep. Where and then girl with the dragon tattoos and I mean it is funny to me. How many of these have girl in the title? Girl on the train, gone girl, girl with the dragon tattoo. I mean, it was, they figured out something with the <laughs> titling of these to be like, do you want this? <laughs> it's girl fiction. Guess what I have? <laughs> I have a girl fiction for you, and we are going to buy just in those three 24 million copies because uh, oh, wow. it has girl in the title. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a little depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, smart, I, right? But yeah, it's like, okay. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. And then um, last. And oh, incidentally, I could also say for a girl with a dragon tattoo, the, one of the things that's unique about it is that it's something that was made into two different film versions very rapidly. Okay. So the idea that it was made and remade, like that's very unique Yeah, uh, for it to mm. be that quick. Well, I, I was going to ask too. I, I remember reading that and then being shocked. It was kind of the first one where you're like, whoa, yikes, what's happening in this story? We've yeah. got torture and it's awful like, stuff. Um, you Norwegians are yeah. a, even a bit of a problem. A bit depressed and bleak up there. Yeah. And cold, worse than Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're lonely, cold, oppressed, and without the friendliness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, last one, rounding out our list. I don't want to know it. But I do, I think, know it. Go ahead. Veronica Roth Divergent. <laughs> I don't. That doesn't make me super happy, but I'm... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, YA, YA fantasy. We get one... Game of Thrones is seriously nowhere in there. You know what? I'm going off of the NPD group, I think. That surprises me. And but I, I don't not... mind yeah. that it's not on there, but it's, it's, yeah. it surprises. Yeah. But that's an example of something where the film versions, the show versions, kind of crushed the desire of people to wade through those massive, I think so. uh, They're filthy, huge. nihilistic In, works. I, I read the first one, recommended unsuspectingly by a cousin, and I was like, that uh, was when I was young. I was commanded to read it for work mm. so that we could have a conversation about plot structure. 
and I, I grabbed, uh, I didn't want to, and then I saw it at Costco in a cheap paperback thing, and I was like, okay, great. Mm. Grabbed it, and I was reading it, and I was like, what am I reading? <laughs> this is like, oh, boy. Like, yeah. this is horrific. Um, yeah. Just absolutely shock, shock structure. Yeah. So, but the fact that the show became as big as it was, I think dwarfed the books and was a long form experience that people preferred to the actual work of reading. Right. So, plus the guy hasn't been able to finish. The yeah, series. I don't mind. I yeah. just, uh, I just don't mind. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess for for Divergent here, it's six point six million copies. Uh, an example, perhaps, of not too shabby. No, and that, but every single one of these, of course, has a high level important major motion picture or several yeah. how close do you tie that success to me it seems like that tail the movie you've got to have it no it, it's the success is connected to um the back end of those numbers would be connected to uh, the film mm -hmm. but if you look at like blockbusters like successful movies that show up on top of successful books the, t the tail, the driver of the movie tie-in edition is not always as big as you might think. Okay. Uh, it can be. So, But things like The Martian, where here's, here's the book and then the Ridley Scott film, and here's yeah. another few hundred thousand copies. You know, it's not like it... Okay, it wasn't insane. It's not like it's nuts. Mm. Always. It's not like a given yep. that it just goes insane. And, it, and it's true, I guess. I don't think... I would expect that uh, the Silo books didn't pick up a huge following of sales after the show. You know the the wool the wool yeah. book. Those I mean they didn't keep the title. Yeah, and that's the worst. That's the worst thing. Yeah, I <laughs> just keep my title. Yeah, just keep the title. So Walter Kern told me that when they were making Up in the Air and making his novel into the George Clooney film, they kept just changing everything and everything and everything and. You know, people are asking him if he cared, and he's like, as long as they don't change the title. <laughs> Just, you can do whatever you want. Because if you're not I, at 8 million copies, it's pretty nice to sell I a couple just, hundred thousand. Yeah, <laughs> I just need you to keep that title. Just yeah. keep the title. Absolutely. Uh, wow. Okay, and then, okay, last, so that that's the past decade, that right there. Yeah, it's um, very interesting. I mean, it's fiction, too. It's a fiction-dominated space i don't think the non-fiction i'm curious gets up there like, i needed, did the list I needed, go, the list go farther like did, i'm it, curious it if they have reporting on things like harry potter through that decade across all seven titles i would expect that to still be pretty significant right um but any, anyway it is it is very interesting yeah so you need to publish more novels with the word girl in the title is what i'm getting here i don't i don't see any other thing either that or 50 so Fifty Shades. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Right? Fifty girls. Fifty girls. With the gong gray dragons. Yeah. That's yeah, that's the fantasy touch. <laughs> it was just it was big for the teens. Yeah, and that's why our AI generators are the way they are. Yeah. That does feel like <laughs> Yes, yes, it is. Uh, it is interesting when you look at success and you So we we I don't remember which I wish Somebody could look this up, but which episode we talked about the different tiers of value when we're actually discussing yeah. how we assess something, and you have kind of the technical. Yeah, it's in our technical, technical, our family technical. movie night ones. I'll put a yeah, link. Yeah, so in you that. have response value, technical value, objective value, and there's a lot of technical value that would exist in books that have been wildly successful, and that doesn't mean that they're valuable in response or objectively, but they definitely know how to make something. Mm -hmm. You know, they know how to do something or they know how to market something. They know how to position something. They, they just yeah. are good at fishing. You know, like they're, even if they're malicious, even if they're bad people, or even if they're uh, totally out there doing ill to the world, there still is going to be some skill involved yeah. and they cannot succeed at all without that. So yeah. it might be, it might be upsetting to see how many people succeed to a, a significant level with nothing but thundering mediocrity in prose or anything else. And I think there's a fair amount of that, but at the very least you can say, man, they knew how to position, they knew how to hit a moment. They saw, well, the, I think, they I mean, saw I think, the market well, or, or I think whatever several of these we would, I mean, we don't want to, I, I, it's funny for me to criticize like Veronica Roth, but saying like, that's, 
me- mediocre prose. Yeah. You yeah. know, but but it's perfectly positioned. <laughs> it captures on the excitement of the houses that Harry Potter had. Yep. You know, like you're, which one of the ver- of the fantasy groups are you going to be? And I only made it about halfway through, but <laughs> you know, you know, and it and it has that same coming of age thing. It has the friend groups. I mean, it's got. The, I mean, yeah. it just it feels like that one's a. When I was when I was rolling out Outlaws of Time, it was from the publisher of Divergent. Mm. Everything, every every single piece of marketing yeah. was the publisher of Divergent. I was just sitting there in the draft. And it's like from the publisher of Divergent comes a whimsical time traveling cowboy story. <laughs> just a, a couple things that yeah. Veronica did not include. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Divergent. it's also funny because my my wife was just telling me yesterday. She's like, you know, you really hit some funny seams when I was doing kind of my subversive thing and writing books the way I. I it bothered me, for example, that fantasy was distinctly Northern European for no good reason. Mm-hmm. And even when it was stealing and borrowing stuff from very cool global mythologies, Persian mythologies, other things, it ended up, you know, in Northern Europe. Everything was Northern European. Yeah. And so with Ashdown, I was very intentionally leaning against that. And it happened coincidentally to align with certain sense of sensibilities in the market at the time where they're like, oh, representation, like different cultures, whatever. People are excited about that. Hmm. By the time I was publishing it, it was gauche. And like, don't you dare. Like, mm. you're you're a white man. How dare you write something and, well, from acquisition, Mesopotamian? <laughs> right. From from acquisition to... Oh, you're saying from Ashtown, the first Ashtowns to And Outlaws. even later, Ashtown. Like, I, that started right. to be a problem with Ashtown. But Outlaws of Time was the same way, where it's like, oh, this is awesome that I'm using some Native American mythology. I was using it because it was cool mm. and because it was Western and because I, I like the idea of trying to draw on the fantasies, fantasies of locales yeah, and I was moving around America doing different things. So I'd done Blur, I'd done the Midwest. Yeah, Florida, I did the Upper Midwest. Midwest. Yep. You know, I had Lee Pike, um, which people still argue over whether it's kind of an Appalachian thing or a Northwest thing, and I refuse to answer. Um, <laughs> I think it's clear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you've but, told enough about that. But it's, um, and then I was going Southwest because the Southwest is actually ancient. Like I mean, the, yeah, to get deep culture here, you got to go Indian. It's ancient. And, it's and very, very the ancient. List, and there's yeah. amazing stuff down there, and so I was, I was drawing on American mythology and writing in the Southwest. And when I was doing that, people were very excited. They said, like, "Oh, this is awesome. This is underutilized. This is cool. You're filling this white space. You're doing all this stuff. The awesome that you're pulling out this Native American mythology." Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and then I was using. You know, Manuelito, and I was doing these, pulling these historic characters into things and giving them these little cameos like I like to do. And awesome, fantastic. By the time we were pubbing, it was like a little embarrassing. How dare you? Yeah. And at the, by the time we were pubbing and going towards print with the first one, there actually was a a structure in place that uh, my editor at the time reached out and said, Hey, would you be willing to pay uh, this sensitivity reader? And I was like, mm, what are we talking about? It's like 3000 bucks to a sensitivity reader. And is that to get the gold stamp or do you I was like, know what why? Gonna... And she's, she said, well, think of it as like, it's like protection money. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> you're paying so that you're not attacked by the mob. Like you're, you're, you're paying, you're trying to get somebody to, uh, read it and give it a stamp of approval. Yeah. Or else. From if the you experts. Don't, and it's not yeah. like, it's it's not a, a situation where if they read it after you refuse to pay them and find that it's great, they're going to let you go. It's like, no, it's you're going to get flagged. People are going to be mad. And I, I drew myself up. I drew, I drew up my skirts and said, absolutely not. I will not do it. <laughs> I will not. Pay protection money. And they came around to your restaurant? For, for, yes, they did. Uh, they did, and it was... The biggest thing was that it made the publisher really frightened, made the publisher really scared. Uh, but right when they came around to the restaurant, uh, J.K. Rowling dropped a short story utilizing Navajo skinwalkers without permission and without being a skinwalker or a Navajo. And how dare she? <laughs> <laughs> and so... She suddenly, this this whole yeah, mob that had gathered with yeah. pitchforks and were banging on the gates of my publisher about me, they suddenly pivoted and it went viral and it was headlines and there was all sorts of stuff. And 
I kind of blissfully went along my way and was like, hey, good news. <laughs> uh, then the next conversation with my publisher was like, uh, like this is, we're, we're sucking on a lemon. It was like, whoopsies, when we bought this, this was a really great thing to do and would have been very virtuous. Mm-hmm. I would have had all the little faux social virtue, but now. Well, that would have been a pretty quick timeline though i mean that fits with it a couple years yeah like two years i mean it takes a while it takes a while to acquire and edit and do everything else so yeah it it shifted a lot that's funny and it it shifted a great deal during ashdown too so this but this was on the tail end of that if only you'd called it girls of time (laughs) (laughs) could have been eight million copies by now (laughs) out girls out 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 girls of time (laughs) that that would have done even better Uh, Maybe in the relaunch, whenever that is, yeah. at some date. Well, it's funny. It actually surprises me that some of these things I've written are still in print. Yeah. Um, and they are, which is funny. Well, people will still quietly to receive the money. They don't. They don't mind right. receiving the money. It's funny. They probably have more problem receiving money from your books than they do. Yeah. From <laughs> from <laughs> from <laughs> yeah. Most most likely. Well, actually, that was all we had is is discussing a, a, the previous decade of bestsellers for today. We can get into a discussion at some point of Neil Gaiman. I don't uh, want to. You don't want to discuss Neil Gaiman? No. Okay. Don't want to do it. No, it's just a question. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to yell outrageous. <laughs> Nate, Nate avoiding criticizing just being Neil like, Gaiman. You are too going to discuss it. This is <laughs> outrageous. Outrageous. Yeah, uh, it's a. Uh, it's yeah. it's pretty funny. We oh. it's, uh, we should talk about Tilt World and Death by Living in the relaunch too. Yeah, uh, we'll we we'll, can tease that right now because the the books look really really. I'm really actually cool. going to go get copies and bring them right now because I was planning on it. Let's just do it next next week. We need to hold it up now, don't you think? You want to do it next week? Next week. Let's do next it next week. week. Great. Yeah, so we'll we'll change this. It'll be a whole different set. Yeah. It'll be magical. Fantastic. We'll talk about that next week. And actually, if you have any questions about Death by Living or Notes from the Tilt World, please send them. Send those in because we'll be discussing them uh, next week because both were just issued in like a cool special collection with some new writing. So yeah, new writing in both and both have been in print for a long time now and are still kind of humming along. So yeah, we're thrilled. To be Fun. offering those. Oh, last note from the previous decade, or decade, I guess, would be they say print books outsold ebooks three and a half to one. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, makes sense. Ebooks are dumb. I don't know why <laughs> I don't enjoy reading ebooks. I don't know anybody who does. You read them because convenient, right? Convenient, or you really loathe them, or it's a thing that's a task, it's disposable, you just have to, you're checking it out or whatever. But the idea, anybody who loves books, loves books. Mm. So the idea of holding up your Kindle and being like, I have this amazing library. It's yeah. like, no, I, I like seeing the spines. I like holding it. I like smelling. I like, I like the smell of my old Tolkien editions. <laughs> what you just said is actually going to be the most controversial thing from this episode. Really? With a very small group <laughs> of people. For a very small group of people about whom I do not care. <laughs> they I need love people. I, I need people who like the smell <laughs> of Tolkien. So, I, I personally, as a child reading Tolkien, got a very strong impression about the smell of Middle Earth from the smell of that particular copy. Yeah. And I think it was fairly accurate. It was very. Like tobacco-y, yeah. mossy. I mean, it, it was perfect. A deep, a deep. Yeah, smell. it was musty, and it was mm-hmm. good. And I, I like, I like that. I like having the texture of the page. I like the smell of the glue. I like it when, I always love the smell of glue. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, white paper that's too white, too bright. I don't like. Like there's, mm-hmm. there's all these different things, and down to typefaces and everything else. The yeah. physicality of the book. It's a big part of the presentation, and so if it's the if the physicality is always the exact same, yeah, that's sad. Yeah, it's just a bummer. Yeah. So I I'm, understand there's a utility to it, and I've read ebooks before when I need to in galleys or uh, other things, but I'd much, much, much prefer holding the. You're thing just going to have to imagine how good notes and death are until next week. Yeah, we'll talk about it next week. There we go. Peace out. Imagine the well-read man. Do you see a machine dressed in tweed, gorging on information? This book is not about becoming that kind of reader. The well-read man wakes up and 
consults with Moses on his way to work. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land. He sips his coffee and ponders the wisdom of Hannibal's elephants crossing the Alps. He turns furrow-browed philosophers upside down and takes their lunch money. He changes his oil and deliberates with Peter Drucker about effective management practices. He regales his wife with the tale of Monet's water lilies in the gardens of Giverny. He sings with Sandra Boynton as his toddler's eyes grow heavy. This book is about becoming that man. Be as human as you can be. Learn how to read a book.